Welcome back to the Red Dice Diaries, and in this Friend or Foe Friday episode, as a special request from Colin Green of the Spike Bit podcast, myself and Hannah Hi. are going to be looking at a monster from the Fiend Folio, the AD&D first edition, Tome of Creatures Malevolent and Benign, edited by Don Turnbull, Managing Director of TSR UK Limited. Okay, so I'm looking at the foreword here to the AD&D Fiend Folio. And in case you're not aware, this is described as the first major British contribution to the Advanced Dungeons and Dragons game system. It has a nice picture of a GIF Yankee wielding a sword on the front of the cover and is copyright 1981 TSR Hobbies Inc. Okay, so let's roll the dice and see what monster we get. So that's a 13. Which is an M, so roll again and see what monster we get. A 2. Okay, so now in the Fiend folio, it's got a sort of A to Z contents page at the front, which unfortunately doesn't have any like page numbers on, so it's pretty much useless. However, it does have an index, but if we flick through to the M section, we can see that the second monster is the Mantari. It's described as a flying creature bearing a close resemblance to the marine ray with a flat body about three foot long, nearly as wide, and a four foot long thin whipping tail. The Mantari, singular and plural, usually play on, prey on giant rats and the like for food, but it is normally 85% chance aggressive when encountering other creatures and humans. It flies with its tail held vertically downwards, but when attacking, diving onto a victim from a height of 10 to 12 foot above ground, the tail assumes a forward pointing acute angle with the body. And the Mantari would appear to strike by whipping a victim with its tail. The sting on the tip isn't poisonous, but it acts on the victim's nervous system. So I'm not sure how that's not a poison to be perfectly honest, if it acts on your nervous system. Um, the number of hit points of damage inflicted by the hit is equal to the difference between 19 and the victim's constitution. So a victim with a constitution 12 would take 7 hit points of damage, which seems like a bit of a weird way of representing it rather than just rolling for a dice of damage. But hey, it's one of those strange early AD&D monsters, as you're fond mm-hmm. of saying, love. No saving throws permitted against the effect of the sting. Furthermore, if the same victim's hit in two successive melee rounds, the damage inflicted by the second hit is four times normal. There is no additional damage bonus for the third or subsequent hits. Each counts as four times normal. The Mantari is found in most types of locale, although its preferred haunts are dirty dungeon chambers where its prey abounds. Okay, so that's the Mantari as presented in the Fiend Folio. Like they say, sort of, pretty much a flying manta ray sort of creature with a bit of a sting the mechanics of like the damage and everything seemed well weird to me yeah i would assume that the not poisonous part is in reference to like the save versus poisons mechanic but having never actually played first ed i'm not quite sure in what way and obviously it's a first ed book it's not massively clear I mean, the only other way I can see it being useful, really, are if you've got some sort of player who somehow has got, like, resistance to poison or damage reduction to poison, obviously by stating that's not poison, those attacks wouldn't be affected by that. Because you'd be like, when the player goes, oh, well, if it's poison, I'm I'm immune to it or I take less from it, you'd be like, well, no, it's not poison. But it's weird because it does seem to behave in other ways pretty much like a poison it affects mm-hmm. your central nervous system the damage gets ramped up the more you get hit by it so i'm not sure whether that was just an attempt to sort of like ratchet up the threat level of the monster or sort of make it a bit weird or a little bit different so one thing that i'll say is i quite like this artwork in spite of it being like very primitive pencil drawing i, I quite like the look of it it's very uh oldie worldy D D to me it looks like it's straight out of the back of some teenagers D D club sketchbook 
Oh no, I've, I've got to say, I, I think it looks absolutely terrible. I mean, it's it's your standard sort of manta ray shape, you know, the big, big sort of wings at, at the side. It's got like a little pointy tail coming down, that's fine. But then underneath, it's just got this really goofy, like cartoon looking face, <laughs> which to me makes it look as though the whole thing, it's like, it's like you've asked like a young kid to draw a ghost, is, is what it looks like to me. I suppose that's why I like it. Fair enough. So I can't say I'm a fan. But anyway, let's go and see if we can find any other books that have got um, something that may be similar into it. I don't recall the Mantari from other books, but obviously there's probably like Manta Rays and such like that. So we'll be back in a moment to tell you what we've found. Okay, so we've not had a great deal of joy finding the Mantari in many other books. I'm going to guess it's not exactly a particularly prevalent monster in d and I think it's fairly safe to say. Mm -hmm. But eventually we have found in the ad and second edition Fiend Folio Monstrous Compendium. Try saying that with your mouthful. Mm -hmm. There is a mention of it and it has a full page write-up picture and stat block as is the way with the sort of ad and monster manual monstrous compendium things it's a pretty similar description close resemblance to marine rays and might be related to them in this they seem to have sort of got rid of the fact that it doesn't do poison with its attack and the tail damage is treated as a poison damage does one to four points of damage a hit and stings the victim if you make a successful save sorry if you don't make a successful saving throw you will lose two points of strength and dexterity with each successful strike which obviously will have quite a bad effect on your combat mm -hmm. scores in the game if either your strength or dex fall to below three the mantari's prey can no longer move once its prey are no longer moving a mantari will land and begin to feed their mouths are ineffectual in combat and are used primarily to suck up the remains of their prey. <laughs> so, in both of these, it talks about them as being quite animal creatures. Yeah. That there's, they're not intelligent and there's nothing particularly magic about them apart from the fact that they're big fish that fly. Yeah, pretty much. Um, so, there's... A little bit in here where it talks about training and keeping one as a pet and uh, that they a young one will go for 200 gold pieces on the open market and it strikes me that they could make for quite an entertaining like group animal companion you know when the whole group gets like latched on to the animal companion because uh, it's yeah. quite a badass creature really if you look at it to have one of them as your pet would be pretty cool. Um, yeah, it, it strikes me that it could be quite a fun little sort of signature bit for a campaign. Yeah, I mean, I can see how it might be like good for druids and whatever, as like maybe animal companions and such like. I do like that in the um, the second ad, Fiend's Folio, Monstrous Compendium, they give you a little bit more sort of detail on their ecology. It's greatly expanded from the original Fiend Folio, describing how they serve a necessary function in caverns and dungeons, keeping vermin under control, uh, eating rats, spiders, and stuff like that. And it describes them as great enemies of bats, since bats and mantari are both animals, I'm not sure if enemies is the right word, but I see what they mean. You know, they're, they're, they're predators uh, sort of competing for the same resources. So I think that's interesting. And it's one of these sort of great uh, pedigrees of monsters where they're sort of almost designed to like enable the dungeon ecology to function. Because if you think about it, really, uh, the dungeon ecology doesn't make a great deal of sense. Mm -hmm. But there was a large amount of monsters, you know, your gelatinous cubes, your things like that, that were sort of designed for when, like, smart alecs go, Oh, but what about all these dead bodies? Why are they lying around forever? Why isn't there things everywhere? Why isn't there rubbish everywhere? And some went, oh, gelatinous cubes, clean it all up. <laughs> and the Mantari strikes me as something very similar. You know, you can be like, oh, why isn't vermin overrunning everything? Oh, there's a couple of Mantari there, like, feeding on things. Oh, why aren't there loads of bats everywhere in this underground Mantari are there? So I can see that it's it's almost seems to have been not designed but sort of retrofitted from the original to serve a useful niche within the very specific dungeon ecology that you tend to find in D, &D games so one of the things that i liked about the ecology is the sentence at the end where it says that some sages believe them to be a magically enhanced form of stingray 
but others believe them to be closely related to cloakers, trappers, miners and lurkers above, which makes quite a lot of sense really when you think about it and again it sort of enhances that ecology thing that you were talking about of having many subspecies of different like genus I'm probably using all those words wrong but you know what I mean yeah and I think it's an interesting point that there are like cloakers and a lot of creatures that have that sort of stingray style sort of body shape that which I personally, I mean, I've not got a proof for this, but I personally think it's because it's quite an alien-looking shape and also it's quite a sort of predatory, sort of dangerous shape. You know, it's got those wings, it's very sleek, it moves quietly and silently. Yeah, if you're, if you're sort of underneath the stingray in the water and you see the shadow go over, it's almost like, you know, if you see a hawk fly over something it's that shadow of the predator sort of gliding unseen which makes it seem quite dangerous i can see in the the monstrous compendium they've also got the great mantari although they don't give stats for it where it says rumors persist of a very large variety of mantari just as fast and aggressive but with a wingspan of nearly 10 foot they are said to be more clumsy in flight but stronger and it gives you some modifications for the hit dice and more dangerous they're said to haunt the deepest portions of the Underdark in great numbers, frequenting the same areas as trappers and their kin. Cool. So there's always a high-level version of it as well. Yeah. Now, um, something that I just noticed you'd skipped over it, and we skipped over it on the previous book as well, is that they have the um, flight manoeuvrability classes mentioned. And I don't know that I've ever played a game that actually uses the flight mechanics. And I note that it says that the manoeuvrability class C on both the Great Mantari here, which it says is more clumsy in flight, and on the first edition version of the Mantari. Tell me about flight in D&D, John. Well, I, I've, I've never really used the sort of flight manoeuvrability rules from like AD&D. And even when I've played it, I don't really know of any games that have used flight extensively enough to make use of those rules. I, I can't remember exactly what the different categories are, but essentially there was a series of different categories and they detailed how if you were flying, how manoeuvrable you were, how what your turning arc was, whether you could hover in place and stuff like that. So... I think whilst it's useful to know that information, personally for me, I think that just having a bit of a write-up saying, oh, they're a bit clumsy in flight, is enough. You don't really need like a whole subsystem for it. Because how often are you going to be playing a game where like your PCs are going to be flying through the air and like dogfighting flying manta rays? I don't know, that does sound like a cool game to play. It does sound pretty cool, but even then I'm not sure I'd need a detailed subsystem for manoeuvrability. That's fair. I I'd just be a case of, like, well, if the players are flying with magic, they've got pretty much perfect manoeuvrability, and all I've got to remember as the GM is the Mantari are a bit clumsier in flight. And generally, True. if something's True. bigger and it's not using magical flight, it's clumsier. Okay, so we've had a, like I say, we've not had a great deal of luck finding other stuff on the Mantari. As I say, they're possibly related to like cloakers and things like that. But we have found on the Forgotten Realms wiki, there's a mention of a creature called an Exit Zachittal, which is also known as the Demon Ray. The picture looks quite similar. This is a, a more sort of aquatic creature that resembles a manta ray, and it's described as being an evil servant of Demigorgon that dwelled in the oceans of Toril. And they're described as being a little bit more intelligent to the point where they... They enslaved other races, and they typically waged war for territory and feeding grounds against sagwins, lacants, merfolk, stuff like that, even attacking coastal human settlements. In the middle of that page, in bright red letters, is the phrase vampiric. It's such a... There, one of them. And it's talking about how groups of them are led by their strongest members... And then it says that the position is often taken up by clerics or a vampiric version of them. Now, presumably, that means that they could get character classes and that they can have the various like, special templates on, like vampiric. Well, yeah, I mean, strictly speaking, any creature that's intelligent 
could acquire a character class. It's described as pretty rare, certainly in earlier versions of the game. But as it says here on the uh, the Forgotten Realms wiki, it says they've got a couple of patron deities, and if they're intelligent enough to worship a deity, then chances are they'll have some sort of shaman or a cleric or someone to lead that worship. So far more intelligent then but water-based, so not really all that much like them, apart from looking a bit the same. Yeah, and I mean, that seems to be, as we were saying, that seems to be the thing with this sort of creature, this sort of manta ray-style creature. They seem to pretty much just take the look of the original animal and then adapt it for whatever niche they're looking for. So in the case of the mantari, it's been adapted to the dungeons. In the case of this, they wanted some, like, aquatic villain who had the sort of slightly devilish predatory look of the manta race they exact adapted it into the Ixa chattel mm -hmm. I'd be interested to see if anybody's done anything with the Polynesian myths about manta rays I don't really know anything about Polynesian myths about manta rays I don't either myself aside from like that they're alluded to in that Disney movie with the rock tell you what we could look them up on the internet Moana yeah, let's have a look. So I've managed to track down the uh, myth about Punga from Maori mythology, which is uh, one of the gods, god of the sea, and all the ugly fish are his children, basically. I've got a feeling he might be the guy from Mighty Johnson's that does the rap. Possibly. Um, we can see on here it says... Punga's a supernatural being who's the ancestor of sharks, lizard rays, and like you say, all ugly deformed fish. And then we've also been able to track down a little bit about the manta in Hawaii, where it's called Hahalua, which means two breaths, because it when it jumps out of the water, it's breathing in the water and then it's breathing in the air, so it's like an ambassador between two worlds. That's pretty cool. Sort of like how um, in the UK we had a lot of cults that were about putting things into rivers and marshes because they were in between places. Yeah, like the bog mummies and stuff like that as well. Always interesting to read stuff about other cultures, other mythology, and yeah, as a DD and d player, it's also always interesting to pull it apart and use it for your game. Yeah, and it's nice because a lot of uh, a lot of the sort of D and D stuff obviously is based on sort of Western, like faux medieval mythology. So it's nice to occasionally like pull on other different areas of mythology and sort of incorporate elements of that into your game, which can just be a nice little twist or a bit of sort of like a bit of a sort of unusual or sort of like breath of fresh air into an otherwise like fairly familiar sort of like trope filled game. So to take things back to the Mantari, unless you've got anything else you want to say about manta ray myths, no. We can can we think of any like interesting ways they can be potentially used in games? Obviously, the default one is they're a dungeon predator that fulfills this particular niche in the ecology, mm -hmm. keeping vermin down, fighting with bats, you know, pistols at dawn, jewels mm -hmm. for manta rays versus bats. Who will win? The only way to find out is to fight. That sort of thing. <laughs> so. Are there any other ways we can potentially think of using them? As I said, I found the idea of them as a pet or an animal companion quite interesting. I think they'd make a great signature animal companion for a group. Yeah. But also, they could make quite a good, like, um, Blofeld-type pet for a villain. Mm. You know, it, I don't think there's anybody who wouldn't look a little bit creepy sitting there stroking a manta ray while it sat on their knee and growled at you. <laughs> yeah, I think for me, the um, the main interesting way I can think of using them is, obviously, a lot of monsters tend to get, like, misidentified. And, you know, I said sort of jokingly at the start that I thought the first edition artwork looked like a ghost that had been drawn by a little kid. Mm -hmm. I think one of the be the interesting ways you could use them is sort of have them misidentified by other people. So let's say you have a village and they've um, they've been doing some mine works near the village or whatever. 
you know as the GM, or they've broken into this underground cavern, which has riled up the Mantares that were down there, and some of them have started coming out to the surface, you know, again, moving between worlds. Maybe the locals have sort of seen the pale underbellies of these Mantari silently gliding through the air, and they've gone, it's the mine's haunted. <laughs> uh, and they've sort of like downed tools, they've run away, and maybe the mine foreman's like hiring the players to say, Oh, look, the mine's haunted. Adventurers, can you come and help me out? I need to get my men back to work and I make that money. Or similarly, maybe they've seen these big flapping things and gone, oh no, there's a load of dragons. Yeah, exactly. So I think, again, with a lot of these sort of unusual versions of animals, so the mantari is basically a manta ray, as we've said, that can fly. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the advantages is, is it's bringing a sea creature that you might otherwise not come across a lot because how many like full ball aquatic campaigns get run that you can bring into a sort of mainstream campaign. But I think with a lot of these animals, the most fun you can get out of them is when they're sort of half glimpsed by people who don't really know what they are and they get misidentified and that leads to sorts of confusion. So as we've said before, when like misidentifying things as undead, you need to be a little bit careful with it and not directly say oh yes, they're ghosts. Because if your players all get torn up and they've got the cleric and everything and they're like rocking in there and you're like, actually, it's a flying stingray, they might feel a bit short-changed. But I think if you do it sort of subtly, it could be quite interesting. And we've seen examples of this in real life, you know, where like um, there's the supposition that the original unicorn myths might have been based on like the rhinoceros and stuff like that that was misidentified by people and then sort of inaccurately portrayed in medieval bestiaries and stuff like that so i could definitely see the mantari filling that particular niche yeah i mean generally speaking it's quite a good wandering monster yeah that you can just throw in and it's unlikely that people will have come across one before so just by virtue of not being a particularly commonly used monster it becomes quite interesting just on the novelty yeah i think you're absolutely right and i think that is the one of the main benefits of using like the fiend folio and some of these earlier books even if you're running a more modern D&D game is because things like the mantari haven't really like massively grabbed hold of like the public consciousness in terms of D&D players and they haven't really been carried forward to sort of modern editions of the game the stats are easy to adapt and if you suddenly bust out these like flying stingrays your players aren't instantly going to be oh it's another orc it's another ogre or whatever so you've got that element of uncertainty and sort of mystery there which although there's no real mystery behind mantari as such because the the sort of the baseline monster isn't intelligent obviously there are intelligent variants out there that you could use but the baseline is just like an animal you could still get a fair amount of mileage out of them just because as you were saying love people haven't really heard of them so it's nice in a way because that sort of puts your players in the same positions as their characters now there is one thing that I don't know whether we want to address or not, but I can see a large group of players on seeing a manta ray instantly devolving into a lot of very bad crocodile hunter jokes. And maybe your players are going to love that. Maybe your players are going to hate that. Just consider it before you start using them. Yeah, so... That's our thoughts on the Mantari, a sort of little-known creature from the Fiend Folio. We hope you've enjoyed that. If you've got any suggestions for how you could use a flying manta ray in your games, maybe you have used one, then you can get in touch with us by leaving a voicemail message on SpeakPipe, link in the description of this show, or you can leave us an email at rddrpgpodcast at gmail.com. Until we see you next time, take care, stay safe, and keep gaming. Bye. Sages believe them to be magically enhanced. Sorry, some. Oh, yeah, not all of them. You don't want the Sages Guild coming after you.